Well, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Joanne Gear. I am the executive director for the Biopharma Research Council. And we are an association for scientists, engineers, and IT professionals across all the different silos of biomedical research. So it includes drug development, discovery, diagnostics, devices, the whole continuum. Uh, we started in 2009, and we've been coming here for the last five years to do the Triangle Biotech Research Symposium. Um, and uh, I'm not going to go through, <clears throat> excuse me, all of the different things we do, but we do have some really interesting things, programs coming up uh, later this year. I hope you, I, I know you'll, you'll have a very interesting day, and with almost each uh, section, we'll have enough time for Q&A, and if we sort of run out of time, feel free to speak to the speakers during breaks and so on. Uh, I've made a personal pitch to some of you, and I make a blanket pitch to all of you. If you find today intriguing, we'd love to invite you to join the committee and be part of developing the program for next year. Each year we take on a different theme. Uh, we've had themes on innovation, on partnerships and collaborations, and this year our theme is D3D, Data, Drugs, Diagnostics. I'm going to introduce Joe Magno, who's going to get the day started, and just want to welcome everybody. Thank you, Joanne. Good morning, everyone. Welcome, everyone. Um, everyone seems to have made it through Matthew's fun few days. Everybody got here OK? Everybody have power today? Yeah, OK. So I'm Joe Magno. I'm your official greeter today. And I'm also the executive director of the North Carolina Center of Innovation Network, or COIN, which was formerly known as the North Carolina Center of Innovation for bio and nanotechnology. It's my pleasure to welcome everyone to the fifth annual Biotech Research Symposium. The theme of this year's symposium is, where's jo where'd Joanne go? Oh, there she is. As Joanne just mentioned, is data drugs and diagnostics. This theme was chosen to draw attention actually to the confluence of these new technologies that are actually impacting our lives, our livelihoods, and healthcare. It's a very interesting time, and new things are occurring every day because many different technologies are coming together in healthcare. Today, we'll be hearing from experts in precision medicine, industry analysis, analysts, uh, folks who understand the Internet of Things, medical device experts, and regulatory experts. Our presenters and panelists throughout the day will be sharing their thoughts, their knowledge, their expertise, and their experience, all in an effort to foster some collaboration and bring attention to this confluence of technologies that's occurring every day in our lives. These things are actually catalyzing some very interesting innovations that are impacting us at a historic velocity and, quite frankly, in many ways, unimaginable to this point in time. You should know that Today's event wouldn't be possible without you being here, without the partnership of the North Carolina Biotech Center, the Biopharma Research Council, and of course, COIN, the Center of Innovation Network. We also want to be very, very thankful to our generous sponsors, who you'll, where is our sponsor? Uh, wanna... Ah, there they are. Please note their names, and throughout the day, we hope that you spend some time with our sponsors. And throughout the day, we're hoping sincerely that you, it's a small group, uh, we hope sincerely that you spend some time with one another and make some uncommon connections, which are actually the motivation for many of the things that will be discussed today. They're uncommon connections. At this point, I've spoken enough, and it's my very great pleasure to introduce Sandy Merkel, who is our keynote. Sandy is a good friend. Sandy is on the board of directors of COIN. And Sandy is also the director of commercial strategy and execution at Metabolon. So without any further discussion, let me introduce my friend Sandy. Thank you, Thank Joe. You. I'm not sure I pushed the right button to, uh, to move on to the presentation. Oh, okay, there it is. Thank you. I don't know if you did that in the back, but thank you. Um, can everyone hear me? I'm supposedly mic'd. I can't hear myself, but so um, 
Thank you to Joe, and thank you to uh, the committee for inviting me here to speak today. And when Joe first proposed uh, having um, someone from our company talk today about data in the dawn of precision medicine, I sat back and I thought, wow, um, I'm not a data scientist, so I'm not going to approach this from a data scientist perspective. I'm not an expert in mass uh, spec, so I'm probably not going to approach this conversation today as an expert in mass spec. But I'm also not a practicing clinician in precision medicine, so I'm not going to approach this presentation today <laughs> from the perspective of, of a, a practicing clinician. But what I did sit back and realize is that um, my job at Metabolon is to be able to work across all of those different disciplines in order to put together a strategy for us to be able to take a um, platform that's really rooted in um, biotechnology and data and translate that into products that can be used in the precision medicine space in order to generate actionable insights, something that a clinician can take to their patient and take action on, whether it's through diagnosis or treatment. So with that in mind, um, what I'm going to do over the next several minutes is take you through or take you on a journey that we as a company have been on over the past um, several years to some extent and in a very much more focused way over the past four um, to five months. Now I'll tell you this journey is very fresh for us as well. It's not necessarily what we expected to do four or five months ago. But when we sat back and looked at the, the competencies that we had developed and the development that we had put into um, our um, technology platform, we knew that this was the path that we had to take. So what I'm going to put up here is very new. It's very new to us. It's very new to um, the industry. And in fact, um, it's so new that we just launched our first product into the precision medicine space 10 days ago. And what I'll do then is take you on the journey of going from developing a technology platform, understanding the data that we've been able to develop from that platform, and then most importantly, understanding how to utilize that data and deliver it to a clinician in a way that they can take action on. I'm not sure that we're working here. Yes, there's nothing working. Sorry. Okay, great, thank you. So I thought we'd first start by just um, trying to align on what precision medicine is. If you think about how precision medicine is utilized out in the medical field, um, the, the term is used in many, many different ways. But when you actually look at um, the literature and you look at how people who um, are developing technologies for precision medicine, you actually can come across a very consistent definition of precision medicine. So I think that's the first thing to consider when we're working in the precision medicine space, that how we talk about precision medicine when we're developing products and technologies, it doesn't necessarily naturally align with how precision medicine is discussed in the medical field itself. So precision medicine has been defined by the NIH as an emerging approach for disease treatment and prevention that takes into account individual variability in genes, environment, and lifestyle for each person. And then if I look at another um, definition of precision medicine that I found that I, I actually like a lot, it's, it's um, defined as compromising specifically customized diagnosis and therapeutic susceptibility to a distinct disease condition based on individualized discrepancies. And I think what's important to understand about precision medicine from our perspective is that precision medicine isn't developing a drug for a specific person. Rather, the goal of precision medicine is to develop drugs that can be um, targeted towards specific conditions or diagnostics that can be utilized to understand a person's individual physiology, right? Um, one other thing I think that is important um, from our perspective when we think about precision medicine at Metabolon is that we don't think of precision medicine as a practice in and of itself. 
So being in this region of the country, most of us have been on the, um, or have seen the path of nanotechnology, right? And nanotechnology at one point in time was put out into the world as an industry. But what we've actually found is that nanotechnology is a subdiscipline of almost every industry there is in, in the world. That's also how we see precision medicine. So we don't see precision medicine as a specific type of practice. Rather, we see the tools that are developed um, for application of precision medicine to be integrated into medicine in a, as a whole. And that's the way we win. If we can have the tools developed for precision medicine integrated into, into traditional everyday practice of medicine, that's where you'll really see the advantages of precision medicine itself. So there are many challenges and advantages that are prescribed to precision medicine. And I've just chosen kind of the top three that you see everywhere. And they are advan the advantages include data. You can produce a lot of data right, when you're working in precision medicine, and that's really one of the goals. Customized diagnosis. This you'll see um, a little bit later that I'll talk about. A lot of the diagnosis that occurs in, in the medical field today is really diagnosis based on symptoms. But when you have nonspecific symptoms, then how do you know the actual root cause? And if you don't know the root cause, you can't develop the appropriate treatment regimen. Right? And so customized diagnosis is really where, what we see as the key and hallmark to precision medicine. And it's that customized diagnosis that uh, um, then allows for targeted treatments. Some of the challenges. Notice the first one is the same as the advantage, data. You can generate enormous amounts of data on a single individual and, um, and, and try to understand their health status from that. But unless you actually know what to do with the data, and how to take the data into an actionable insight, that data actually becomes a challenge. It becomes a barrier as opposed to an advantage. Another challenge is integration into traditional, to traditional practice. Again, if we can achieve this, then I think we have really reached the, the goal of what precision medicine can offer. But getting precision medicine, which is a completely different way of thinking than how traditional medicine is taught today, integrated into practice is one of the biggest challenges. And then finally, cost and feasibility. Now it's interesting that cost and feasibility is often put forward as a challenge to precision medicine. But at Metabolon, we would argue that if you can actually implement true precision medicine, not necessarily personalized medicine or thinking about developing single drugs for single individuals, you can actually reduce cost and create more feasible solutions and treatment regimens for um, patients than what we have today with traditional medicine. So um, I'm going to take you um, on a little bit of a journey, as I mentioned, of something that we have recently done. And I think what's important to keep remembering as we move through this journey is, is that in reality, what we're talking about here isn't data. So we're talking about data in the dawn of precision medicine, but it's really not data that we're talking about. What we're talking about is health and well-being. Right? What we're talking about is understanding symptomology and what the underlying physiology is of that patient that's creating that symptomology. It's not about the data that we generate, it's about the understanding of the physiology that comes from that data. It's about finding a faster and better diagnosis, and it's about finding a treatment regimen that's more effective and can be applied at an earlier stage of disease. And I'm going to take you through a product that we just launched, as I said, 10 days ago. And this product allows for a clinician to screen across a broad spectrum of diseases that typically impact infants and small children. And if these diseases are not caught early enough, these diseases can lead to, um, to problems in development, delayed development. They can actually uh, lead to brain damage if seizures are allowed to continue for too long. But over this class of diseases um, that have a genetic uh, component to them, the symptomology is very nondescript. It's non-differentiating. You can't tell the difference between one disease and, an, one disease and another you, from the symptoms alone. You have to do the genetic analysis. And you can do the genetic analysis, but the problem is, is that some of these diseases will have 49 different gene mutations that could or could not be associated with them, and some that could or could not be associated with other diseases. So even the genetic predisposition of these infants still does not tell the full story. And so what we have done is we've developed a metabolomics test that can be used along with clinical data and symptomology 
and genetic data that shows where you may have specific gene mutations to give insight into what is actually happening in real time in the physiology of that patient. So inherently what we're doing is identifying the root cause of the undifferentiated symptomology that we see in these patients. A little bit about our company, Metabolon. Um, Metabolon is, is working to advance life sciences research and improving health through the use of metabolomics. We were founded in 2000, and we have over 160 employees, most of whom actually sit right here in Research Triangle Park, just around the corner on Davis Drive. We run a CLIA-certified and CAP-accredited lab, and we've completed to date over 4,000 studies with over 600 clients worldwide and more than 500 publications. So when we talk about um, our clients, I just told you we're doing something new and releasing um, a product into the precision medicine market. That is a new um, industry segment for us. The clients that we have worked with previously are typically uh, university researchers, pharmaceutical companies, consumer goods companies, and companies who are trying to understand what is um, happening either in their drug development process or in their um, product development process from the perspective of metabolomics. So how do we think about metabolomics and how do we view metabolomics in the context of, um, of a human? Now, this can be applied to plants, it can be applied to um, other animals, and we do do a lot of work in that area as well. But in the case of precision medicine, how it can be applied to a human? Well, we look at genomics, right? You have your genes which suggest what diseases you may be predisposed to um, or what genetic mutations may be impacting your current health. Along with lifestyle and environment, these are external factors such as diet, exercise, medications, et cetera, that can then impact your health. And we use metabolomics to determine your specific phenotype. And it is a real-time assessment of what's happening in your physiology at the time the test was performed. Because we know that your genomics is static, right? You have a, you have a genome, you have certain mutations, that's static. We know your lifestyle is constantly changing. So if your lifestyle is constantly changing and your genome is static, genome is static you're not going to see the impacts of your lifestyle and your environment necessarily back on your genome. So the intermediary between the two is your phenotype. Your genomics establish your baseline phenotype for your metabolism. The lifestyle and an environment that you're in then impacts back on your metabolism to give a real-time indicator of your current health status. It's with these omics technologies as a whole Primarily metabolomics working symbiotically and in a complementary way to genomics, but also having some um, components of lipidomics, transcomics, and, and proteomics that allow us to transform healthcare through science and through these biotechnology tools with a key reliance on bioinformatics and data analytics. And the promises of omics technologies are many. Some of the key promises are advancing an understanding of the pathways, causes, and treatments of disease, improving clinical diagnostic accuracy, therapy selection, and monitoring, accelerating therapeutics research and drug discovery processes, driving innovation in personalized and precision medicine and companion diagnostics, and catalyzing scientific breakthroughs in food, energy, agri and agriculture sectors. So combined, the omics disciplines, along with bioinformatics and big data and analytics, have the potential to change the world, everything from human health to the environment. And the application area for these types of technologies are broad. The clinical space, the research field, applied markets, the pharma arena, personal health and fitness. And I would say that the predominance of the work has contributed to advances in the research field applied markets in the pharma arena. And what you're starting to see now is an emergence of the impact of these technologies on the clinical space and personal health and fitness. Now, I will say one thing to keep in mind is that while we talk about metabolomics being new to the clinical space, much like genomics was a decade ago, we have to realize that we've actually been using metabolomics in the clinical space for years. Many of the routine tests that you have on blood panels that are done regularly um, are actually measuring small molecules. They're measuring metabolites. But physicians don't think of it that way. They think of that test as being a test on a specific chemistry that then has a specific indicator of your health that goes along with it. 
So while this type of technology has been used for decades in traditional medicine, training of physicians of what that test actually is and expanding that out to understanding the interplay between metabolomics and genomics is, is not um, done today in medical schools. We have a very big deficit in, in our um, classically trained physicians on how to utilize metabolomics, genomics, and big data in their daily practice. So um, at Metabolon, again, we started, I know this is a little bit difficult to see up here, or at least it is for me. Um, we started developing, as I mentioned, our technology in 2000. And over the past um, 15 years, we have made enormous strides in how we're able to actually deliver data. So we've been um, making strides in data quality, and our data quality continues to improve every day. We run what we call the Discovery HD4 platform, which is a combination of, of um, LC Tandem MS and GC MS. And it, we run four um, LC platforms and one GC platform. And what we're able to do is generate data that is of higher quality from the perspective of reproducibility, um, accuracy, and precision than anyone else in the field. We've also been able to um, increase the number of metabolites that we are able to measure well beyond anyone else in the field as well. So if you think about the type of technology that we're doing and the fact that we're running um, four arms of this platform and you think that you can generate tens of thousands of data points from this type of technology in terms, it, it, uh, with respect to ion features. Now we know that a lot of those ion features are simply background noise and that's the first challenge in metabolomics is how do you filter out the background noise so you can actually get to the real data that will tell you something. Well, we have taken a chemocentric approach at Metabolon, and we have developed a chemical reference library of over 4,500 known molecules and 9,000 different novel molecules that we're able to then scan the, metab the metabolone and identify within minutes metabolites that have fluctuations relative to a norm. <coughs> so again, we scan the entire metabolome of various biological samples, fluids, cells, tissues, etc. Then we have developed a proprietary software package that's linked directly to our platform and allows for real-time analysis of the data to filter out the background noise and compare it to the chemical reference library to automatically generate a profile of metabolites as opposed to 40,000 ion features in real time filtering out the background noise that you typically see with this type of platform. We've then developed a proprietary data management system that allows for pattern recognition so we can look into our total data um, files and look at patterns of metabolites that are fluctuating relative to a control and immediately identify the various pathways then um, sorry, the various pathways that are key to differentiating one sample or a control sample to an experimental sample or a patient sample. And we've developed a visualization technology that takes that data, puts it into distinct pathways that you can then look at and assess whether or not you see changes or aberrations in that specific pathway. And once you start to be able to look at specific metabolic pathways and differentiate a normal from a diseased or an abnormal, now you have the capability of diagnosis. Not diagnosis based on symptomology, but diagnosis based on root cause. Because we know that we can change the disease if we can change the profile of that pathway and change it back to a normal profile. Just for time's sake, we'll skip over this. So what, I've, what we've discussed is that using mass spec, identifying or, or gathering the data, managing the data in such a way that we filter out the background noise, and putting it into distinct pathways that can then be impacted, in many cases, via diet, nutrition, or drugs, 
We then do pattern recognition and feed that into various algorithms and mathematical models, and we're now moving into machine, machine learning to, um, to speed this as well, to provide actionable insight. And with actionable insight, we get diagnosis and effective treatment. So this is really the path that we take from data to diagnosis, or from data to what we're really talking about here, which is human health. So I mentioned that we had just released um, a, a new product in the market, and it's utilizing this exact process. The process going from mass spec, filtering out background data, working with a manageable data set, feeding that into um, uh, software um, components that allow for pattern recognition, um, as well as correlation, and then passing it through algorithms that allow us to make an assessment on whether something is normal or outside of the expected range. And we're able to, um, with this product, take undifferentiated symptomology and drive towards diagnosis. Once you have diagnosis associated with root cause, that's when you can drive towards treatment. And in this specific test, what we've been able to identify is 275 relevant metabolites. So now not have we only gone from the 4, 000, um, 40,000 plus ion features to the thousands of uh, known and novel metabolites, but now down to 275 specific metabolites that we can assay against to assess uh, disease. Again, using algorithms and mathematical models, we're able to identify indications for 65 different congenital metabolic disorders. And many of these disorders are actually rare diseases. So they're not diseases that you're going to be able to necessarily identify through, um, through other means, because other types of tests that are on the market to identify these disorders are targeted. So you have to have an idea of what the disease might be and then select that test in order to assess for that disease. In the case of what we're doing is you can have no idea of what that disease may be, scan the metabolome, and it will then target you from the 20, 275 relevant metabolites that are assessed to one of the 65 um, congenital metabolic disorders. And then we can, we can um, merge that with genomics data and, and um, the symptomology of the patient and arrive at a final disease. So an example of how this works. Um, this is actual data that has gone through our entire process all the way to the vis visualization platform. And um, this data, or this patient, it was later found out, has a condition called mitochondrial myopathy, encephalopathy, Lopathy, lactic acidosis, and stroke-like episodes. The symptomology is what I've been showing you on the um, slides with the, with the sleeping infant. Um, it, they're undifferentiated uh, headache, fatigue, nausea, vomiting, inability to eat, et cetera. And when, when we feed this, the data into our visualization platform, any circles that are blue means that this metabolite is considered to be low compared to a norm. Any um, circle that is red means that the metabolite reference is considered to be high compared to the norm. And the size of the circle ref, uh, refers to um, the degree to which it differentiates from the norm, OK? So when we first look at this map, we think, well, there are some areas where we see distinct problems. But when you actually do the, um, run the algorithms and mathematical models on this test, what we find is that these pathways up here are what caused this patient to be uh, outside of an expected range value. And when we were able to, and you, you can't read it here, and I, 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 can't, I can't read it either, but when we were able to look at the various metabolites that were problematic, um, we were able to then refer back into our database, our data management system, and find the patterns, find other patient patterns that are consistent with the pattern that we see here. And finding that, that consistency in the pattern is what leads us to the diagnosis of the specific disease. Now, once we had that preliminary diagnosis of the disease, again, along with the symptomology and the genomics data, we were then able to say, well, if this is really the disease that this patient has or the disorder that the patient has, we know that carnitine supplementation should mitigate that disease. And 
you can't read it, but trust me, right here is carnitine. Now, carnitine is at normal levels. It doesn't have a blue or a red dot over it, so carnitine is at normal levels. So this is the type of disorder in this specific patient that if you just did a targeted assay towards carnitine to look at the total levels of carnitine in that patient, you would not find an abnormal test. That patient would test normal. Because it's not carnitine levels that appear to be a problem, it's something in the carnitine processing further down in the pathway. So here, a targeted test that should give you a yes or a no answer to whether the patient has this disease would not have detected this disease. But if we were right on the diagnosis, then once we give high levels of carnitine to, draw, to try to artificially drive that pathway, then we should see mitigation of disease in the patient. So we started treating the patient with carnitine. And after carnitine supplementation, you can see a return of the um, metabolism of that pathway closer to normal. And this is carnitine. So this is evidence of the high levels of carnitine that that patient is being supplemented with. So again, you, ha you have the patient prior to carnitine treatment, diagnosis of the patient, and carnitine treatment that allows for mitigation of the aberration seen in the metabolism. So that's, it, it, um, if you look at what we have done here, this is what we know is happening behind the scenes. All of the processes, all of the data filtering that we're doing, um, going from 40,000 plus ion uh, features all the way down to 275 metabolites that we assay for, right? We know that that's what's happening. But what we're learning is that um, in the medical field, the physicians can't take that information. <laughs> they just, they don't have the time, they don't have the training, they don't have the capacity to take that information and do something with it. So our next challenge was to say, how do we get the medical field to hear this, this information to accept the information and then to take action on that information. And it becomes almost close to an exercise in marketing, right? It's about making a communication tool that physicians from their various perspectives can then see the output of the data, of the data and take action. And so this is still something that we're working on. It's something that we are using today, but as we send this out to physicians and have physicians use the, uh, this report, we get input back from those physicians on how we can make that report better for them. But let's say you have your general um, pediatrician uh, looking at this report. So unfortunately, this is not for the same um, condition that I just showed you. This is for um, arginemia. But um, what we do is we list all of the different disorders that our test right now has been clinically validated to assay for, okay? And once we identify what, um, what we see from the data, we tell that physician that their patient is either showing inside of the expected range or outside of the expected range, indicating a specific disease. So, for, that pay, for the physician who has 30 seconds to review his charts before he walks into um, an office with that patient, he can now see what we are putting forward as a potential indication for that patient. In addition to that, we list all 275 metabolites. So for that physician who has a little bit more time and a little bit more understanding of what the metabolism is and what metabolomics is, that physician can then go and look and see which metabolites actually were um, measured inside or outside of the expected range, right? Now, most of these cases are not coming through your general pediatrician at this point in time. Most of these cases are coming through specialists, and most, many of those specialists are working through clinical labs. So what we also provide, um, especially for those instances, is the, uh, the output of our visual visualization technology so that you can actually see the perturbations in the various metabolic pathways and you have highlighted for you the different metabolites that are showing inside or outside of the expected range and which of, which of those are high, which of those are low, plus some language about how we've come to these conclusions. And the benefit of this is that um, you'll have the clinical labs or the specialists have a very high level of understanding of these different metabolites that are involved in, in the metabolic pathways affecting these children. And so they'll then take this and combine it with genomics data and their symptomology to then move forward on a diagnosis and treatment plan for that patient. So we have just launched um, a new uh, product on the market that allows us to go from vast amounts of metabolomics data 
um, to actionable insight provided by a physician leading to an eventual diagnosis and treatment. So remember at the very beginning when we talked about some of the challenges of precision medicine, we talked about cost and feasibility. We think that while we don't have it perfected yet, we are on the right path to making it feasible to deliver this type of data to physicians. But most interestingly, I think from a cost perspective, we've been able to, with one test, lead physicians to not only a diagnosis, but an understanding of the root cause of the disease, which means a faster time to treatment. And if you can have a faster time to treatment in some of these patients and avoid long periods of seizures, loss of brain function, um, developmental delays, all of those are irreversible. So if we can get faster to diagnosis and treatment, you can actually decrease the overall cost of healthcare for that patient over their lifespan by the millions. So if you want to talk about cost in precision medicine, yes, there is an upfront cost of developing the technologies that can be used in precision medicine, but the overall cost to the healthcare system can be realized as a significant reduction in a very short period of time. So with that, I'll say thank you, and then take any questions that you may have. Yes, I think you were first in the back. I'll keep it quick. Thank you very sure. much. Thank you very much. I was curious, you referred to your database. Is that a proprietary database, or are you pulling from public sources when you do that reference back in yeah. to help for that diagnosis? That's a great question. So the question was, was is the database that we have built, the um, chemical reference database, is that a proprietary database, or is that something that um, has been um, outsourced through public sources? We've actually chosen the path of developing our own proprietary database. And the reason for that is that um, if, we want to take, um, if we want to take the technology into the precision medicine space, or any medicine space for that matter, then we need to have the quality assurance that's what, that what is in that database we can stand behind. Um, when you source from open data sources, um, the data is only as good as the data that's put into it. And we, did, we felt like that was too high of a risk to put out into the medical field. So the database is proprietary, and we've built that specifically off of our platform. Yes? You indicated that you looking at 65 different diseases. That's correct. In general, I guess, is there like thousands of diseases eventually you're going to put into your database? It's a great question. In this specific case, the inborn, uh, or the uh, inherited metabolic disorders, um, there are, um, just under 200 known disorders, um, but we actually think there are thousands of them. And the reason we say that is because the disorders that have been identified, first, they're rare, and so there aren't a large number of cases throughout the world for individual disorders. But if you remember that the disorders have previously been characterized by their symptomology, and what we think we'll see is that over those couple hundred um, disorders that have been identified, once you move past symptomology and down into root cause, you'll actually find subgroupings of um, disorders within those overall disorders, if that makes sense. Yeah. So this, this is a follow-up based on the first question. Sure. So that means that do you have to go to patients that have these symptoms and collect samples from patients to get enough statistically significant data to have a database that you feel confident with? Yes. So um, what, we, what we have done, so there are two ways that you can do it. You have real time where you have patients coming in with disease. But just because these diseases are rare doesn't mean they're new. And so you do have um, collections of samples from patients previously who have presented with these symptoms and presented with these diseases but haven't passed through a metabolomics platform. So the speed at which you can actually build the clinical data that allows you to validate your um, findings is, is much faster than real-time patients coming in. We've been able to go back into various collections throughout the world um, in order to build that database. But it does also allow us to continuously build the database, right, with new patients who are coming in, and then as we access, um, uh, again, different um, uh, pools of samples throughout the world, we can continue to build out the number of diseases and disorders. Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, the, the, the talk is a kind of unfolded talks about this is a diagnostic. Mm -hmm. The reports that is a deliverable to the physician looks like a lab report. Mm -hmm. 
What is this? Is it a lab test or is it a diagnostic? So it depends on how you want to differentiate those, right? Is it um, an FDA-validated diagnostic test? It is not, right? Um, it would actually be very difficult to achieve that because we are working in rare disorders. What it is, though, is it is a, an LDT um, that when, when we look at the data that comes off of it, it leads us in the direction of a diagnosis, but we do not promote the test as a standalone diagnostic. It is a tool to aid in the diagnosis along with geno uh, genetic data um, as well as the clinical data. And so that's why we, we work currently with clinical labs because the clinical labs can take the entirety of the tests and then deliver that data back to, to the physician. Okay, so from a strategic perspective, mm -hmm. as you see the FDA futzing with the laboratory developed test guidance and you know what the final guidance is, from a strategic perspective, what are you doing um, in order to meet whatever mm -hmm. the FDA might present you with? It's a great question. So the first thing we're doing is building up our number of total um, samples that we run through the test, right? So similar to the question that you had before, how are we actually building this database of diseases to, uh, from which to compare it back to? So we're actively working to um, build up that database to um, the potential of developing it into a full diagnostic test. Um, the second thing that we're doing is we're working already with regulators on uh, managing the rare disease component of it because there is different regulation around rare diseases as opposed to common diseases where you can actually have a large enough uh, sample population in order to get um, to make diagnostic claims. So we're working on both sides, finding those disorders where we can work towards potentially a diagnostic and then on the other side with regulators and understanding uh, how we need to build out the rare disease component. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. many more. But, uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, yes. Great talk. I mean, it's really fascinating technology. Um, I have a curiosity. Um, you said your company released a product. Uh, I was curious to know, um, is this product consisting in the, let's say, technological capability of your company, which I, I see you have, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or is there a specific product that uh, clinicians, physicians have to, say, fill with blood sample or urine sample as if you were a sort of a lab on a chip that does some prep work on the sample prior to, uh, let's say, upstream to the mass spec. Mm -hmm. uh, so is it a product uh, that you're mentioning, a real product that goes in upstream to the mass spec and delivers a prepped sample to the mass spec? Or is just a, say, a, a, a platform that you, uh, a technology that you, that you uh, a capability that you provide to, to uh, and in other words, so in that in that instance, uh, uh, people will just send in samples of mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. blood, urine, or whatever fluid it is. Right. So we a little bit of both, right? So on our services side, where we're working um, on, on a project base with um, other companies, right? Uh, that's more of a, a service offering. So they just send their native samples to us, and we do all the processing of those samples and load them on the mass spec, etc. On the, um, on the side of precision medicine, uh, <clears throat> we're, we're still working out our strategy on this. And here's why. First of all, these are, these are plasma samples. So there is some processing that needs to be done at the physician's office or at the blood lab of those samples before they're sent to us. Um, and, and so what the physician is given as the product is essentially the um, instructions, the tube, the collection methods, on how to get that sample to us, how to properly process that sample. Um, we are still considering whether we take that a step forward and have them do not quite lab on a chip, but more closely related to lab on a chip to decrease the processing in-house on our side. But then from the scientific standpoint, we also want to have a significant amount of that control of that processing so that we can be referring back to our database without a, a lot of issue. So we've kind of gone right to the middle. I mean, if you talk to our scientists, ideally, they would want to be able to ship the blood to them and they do every bit of processing, but that's just not feasible. Um, from the um, perspective of the, of the commercial side of things, we would love to have them do all the processing and they send it to us ready to load on the machine, right? So we actually have gone right down the middle. We have the physician do um, some processing and then we do the processing required for our instruments. 
samples that you get from patients, how do you get access to individual patient samples and about how many individual patient samples do you have in your database? So also when the data come through, so if you're working with a lab, how much information can you get that accompanies the sample without having to worry about PII or, or how much information they're willing to give you about the patient who provided the sample? Sure, that's all done um, contractually, right? So for instance, on the, on the test that I talked you through here today, um, looking at inherited metabolic disorders, we are working with a clinical lab, and under the contract of that clinical lab, we stipulate what information we would like about that patient in order to keep building out the database. All of the samples come to us de-identified. So we do not carry any, um, any um, identifying data. Uh, we don't take on any personal health information. Um, and we're not, we're not set up to do that today, which is specifically why on this first launch we've chosen to work with this clinical lab, because the clinical lab can handle all of that information that we are not set up to manage. Um, if we decide, and it's a big if, um, if we decide to move to direct to physician sample management, we would have, to, we would have a large undertaking in order to manage um, identifying data and personal health information. We're not ready to do that today. Where do we get our samples from? Um, our samples come from all over the country right now on this test. Um, on the, the uh, services work they do, they, they come from all over the world. On this test, they come from all over the United States. They funnel through our partner at um, Baylor, Baylor College of Medicine Genetics Lab. Um, and then um, all of the data is transferred <coughs> back to Baylor, who has all the information then to send out to the physician. Samples that have been used to build the database um, have come obviously from Baylor as well as various labs across the country or, or various institutions across the country that have um, banks of these types of samples. Yes? How long does it take from the, collecting the sample to getting the result that you have? That's a great question. <laughs> and that's one of the biggest challenges with this test, right? Right now when people think of, of des tests that are used in diagnosis, they're thinking that at most it's sent to a blood lab in the hospital. But this actually has to come to us. And so our turnaround time in terms of um, the time that the samples hit our docs to the time that we can turn data back out is as short as three to five days. However, the um, time from which the physician makes the request to the clinical lab, then the samples are actually sent into either the clinical lab or to Metabolon, run on the platform. The data is returned back to the clinical lab integrated with the other data the clinical lab has, and then sent back out to the physician, we put a 21-day guarantee on, on, on that. Yes? There, there is also great precedent for inborn screening of newborns because they've been doing it for, what, 20 years, 25 years? Yes, they have. So over, what you're mentioning is over the past 20 to 25 years, all the states across the country have implemented a newborn screening program. And these newborn screening programs screen for anywhere from 28 to 32 different um, inherited metabolic disorders. Um, and this is done on a blood spot that's taken from the infant at birth. And this, these tests have a turnaround time of 24 hours. The um, patients that we see are usually the patients who end up with a either false positive on these tests and they can't figure out why. Or they end up with a false negative on this test, meaning the patient is showing a specific phenotype, but they can't find a diagnosis for that patient. Um, and, and you can imagine that if you are using tests that have a 24-hour turnaround time, usually measuring one metabolite, this patient that I showed you would have passed right through that with no um, issue. They would have been one of the false negatives because they're showing symptomology, but it's not the carnitine level that's a problem. It's something that's downstream from carnitine. So... Um, those, those, those state-run testing programs, however, I think have elevated the understanding and the need for um, getting a faster diagnosis and faster treatment into these um, uh, patients. Yes? From a technology perspective, mm -hmm. um, the, the desirability to go to machine learning yes. is, is, um, is, is apparent. But you know, between now and, and at that time, mm -hmm. um, there's a constant analysis of data. Uh, and I would imagine, uh, you could tell me I'm wrong, that there's a constant assessing of the value, accuracy of the algorithms that you're using. Yes. How often are those algorithms changed? Mm -hmm. So 
let's start back with, um, there's even a step earlier that requires quality control and analysis, right? So when we compare the metabolites and um, do the recognition of the metabolites back to our chemical reference library, we actually have a manual step there where we have data curators who are going through those data files and matching those data files back um, manually. That's where we want to first implement the machine learning because if we can see, um, if we can see small outliers um, uh, and not have to have a person looking for those small outliers, then the cost of the tests can be reduced drastically as well as the time because right now that's our, our most time limiting step. It only, it only takes an overnight run to get all the data off the platform, right? It's not the data that's an issue. Acquiring the data, it's the analysis of the data. So that's where we want to implement the machine learning. And then the next phase will be to implement um, algorithms that are actually a little bit more fluid in terms of, um, of the algorithm flowing and fluctuating as the data that's coming in flows and fluctuates. Sure. We're not ready to do that as an industry yet. Um, from a regulatory perspective, I don't think regulators are ready to see <laughs> that type of modeling quite yet. Um, and then being able to explain that to our clinical labs so that the clinical labs know how to talk about this to the specialists. They're not ready to see that yet, but, but we are starting our thinking on how to build that. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> please, have this. Can he ask? You, please, please raise his hand yeah. five times. Quick, you've been okay. waiting. Okay, go ahead. One um, more question. How do you, you said that the, uh, the site has to do some of the processing of the sample and then sends the sample to you to run on your platform. How do you, um, how do you maintain, a lot of sites have non-compliance when it comes to sample processing mm -hmm. and, and how do you deal with that with sample stability getting to your lab and how does that affect your metabolites as you're processing? Right. It's a great question. So right now our, sh our, our methodologies for, so first of all, like I said before, the sample typically is going to th flow through the clinical lab first. That allows for de-identification of the sample and, and some short processing. Um, the transfer of that sample to our site then is probably the most critical step in maintaining the integrity of that sample to the point where when FedEx misses a shipment, that causes a significant challenge for us as it stands today. Um, from a commercial perspective, that's actually the part of the process that we're more working most aggressively to fix. So currently we have these um, plasma samples being shipped to us overnight on dry ice. Um, we're right now doing some empirical testing of different methodologies. And then if we find a methodology that can work, we will see a shift in the metabolites. But it's a matter of bridging from the methodology that we've done before in understanding the, met the metabolic profile and bridging that back to a new metabolic profile, but you can do that through pattern recognition. Yep. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.